Hi, everyone. Welcome to uh, the Chicago International Film Festival, our preview screening of The Dissident, directed by Brian Fogel. I, um, I hope you all enjoyed the film. We have with us the director of the film, Oscar-winning director, Brian Fogel. Thanks so much for coming, Brian. Um, you're having a busy day. Uh, of well, kind of coming. <laughs> yeah, right. For being here uh, on yeah, the, and uh, from, the, from, the, from your office. <laughs> So um, um, yes, from my uh, from my home office. Very good. So uh, I wanted to start off the conversation by kind of a bigger a bigger question. Um, you know, having uh, taken on Russia uh, and, and the you know exposing the doping scandal in Icarus, and now going against uh, you know another major political force in the world. Saudi Arabia with the dissident. Um, I'm wondering, um, you know, what is your feeling uh, about, you know, global power, and, um, you know, what's happening in the world in terms of like these people, these 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 cultures, these countries wielding such power uh, in such like frightening ways. I mean, I, I, you have a sort of inside knowledge and you've spent you know, so much time in the last few years looking in these, at these halls of power and the, um, uh, the insidiousness uh, that goes on. Right. Like, what is your feeling about the world you know, and, and, and the, the way that power is wielded? Well, look, um, I don't think that there is any really shocking surprise that um, money uh, and business and that allure of massive investment money um, appears to be the driving force uh, in society and humanity. Um, look, we see this, you know, with China, where, you know, a country that has had, you know, a uh, 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 an appalling record of human rights abuses uh, to this day. Um, you don't see any businesses or American businesses or media companies uh, on and on basically going, you know what, we're not going to do business with China. They're just too big. There's too much money. And in the same case here with Saudi Arabia or the Emiratis, um, you know, it, it, we see you know, uh, a, a country that is an authoritarian, uh, essentially dictatorship with a, uh, a new prince uh, that has positioned himself as a reformer and an enlightener. Uh, at the same time, uh, you have people like Lujain al-Hatul, the Saudi woman's rights activist, sitting in a jail um, uh, and uh, her trial is going on there right now. And the prosecutor has asked for 20 years. Her crime is basically for saying that women in Saudi Arabia uh, should have a right to decide whether or not they wear a full burqa uh, so that they're uh, other, uh, other than their eyes. And her second ask um, was that women in Saudi Arabia should be allowed to leave the house without the permission of an 18 year old male. For that, she's looking at spending 20 years of her life in jail. So this is the reality of what's going on. And yet at the same time, you see every American bank, every American venture capital firm, every major media corporation, Fortune 500 and members of the G20 still willing to take the money, accept their money, be in business with them. Um, and that has also been, you know, the struggle that we've found uh, behind this film, which is, you know, we, we came to, to the Sundance Festival um, with, uh, you know, with uh, uh, couldn't have asked for, you know, for any uh, uh, better uh, reviews or receptions. I mean, we met with, you know, raucous standing ovations. Hillary Clinton was at our premiere. Even Reed Hastings, the CEO of Netflix, was at the premiere. Um, and here, you know, um, you know, humbly, I won an Academy Award uh, two years prior for a film that, you know, uh, really took on uh, uh, Russia and, and the doping scandal there and walked out of there without a single 
uh, offer for distribution, despite um, the accolades that came uh, from the festival, despite being on every uh, person's top 10 list. And what this says is it sends a message um, is that um, films like this that speak truth to power, uh, that are shining a light into injustices, um, are becoming more and more difficult um, to be uh, presented to a global audience uh, because of the conflict of, of business interests or subscriber growth uh, or investment or whatever, you know, uh, that I think we've ever found today. And um, did, you, um, did you ever hear and this directly from Amazon or Netflix? I mean, Amazon in particular, you would think with, you know, with Jeff Bezos being such an important figure in the film, did you ever uh, talk with them? Did they ever say anything to you? I, uh, I'm going to uh, uh, not comment on specifics, <laughs> um, but, but, the, but the proof or the end result is in the action, which is the film was financed by the Human Rights Foundation uh, with charitable donations. Um, and the film not being on a global streamer is not a function or uh, a lack of being able to reach a deal or a sale price. It is for, you know, essentially the, uh, the complete radio silence uh, from all the major um, distributors and streamers um, that, uh, that could have acquired the film. And, and clearly it's not because of the quality of the film. It's not because of, um, my uh, and my creative teams, uh, you know, uh, Laurels as filmmakers, it's not because of whether or not a global audience would want to see this film uh, just as they had Icarus. Um, it is, you know, it is Saudi Arabia and the pressure that they have exerted uh, through, you know, through fear, uh, retribution. I mean, you see it in the film, right? uh that these guys play dirty and uh and i think that that those tactics um have you know have led to um essentially not only you know trump and his administration letting them get away with it but all of these companies essentially going hey we'll let you get away with it too and uh you know and that and and uh, and and that's the uh, uh, and that's the reality. On the other hand, you know, the film will be coming out in in theaters and limited markets on December twenty fifth. Uh, we have Briarcliff Entertainment and Tom Ortenberg, a fearless distributor. Um, and COVID, uh, uh, unfortunately, has got in our way of being able to be in theaters all over the United States uh, and globally, uh, as we have been uh, been very successful in and getting independent distribution outside, um, you know, the major streamers and studios. Uh, and the film will be available January 8th uh, across all the video on-demand platforms. So people will be able to go and rent it uh, on Amazon or rent it on uh, iTunes or Apple uh, or rent it on Roku uh, or Comcast or DirecTV, uh, et cetera. Let's talk more about the film itself. Um, I'm wondering, uh, you know, one of the key figures in the film is Omar um, in Montreal, the activist. Um, sort of two questions related to him is one is how did you gain access to him? And how were you able to ensure his safety by cooperating in the film? Um, you know uh uh gaining access to omar there were there were three major components uh to being able to tell the film one was gaining the access exclusive access and participation of uh omar abdulaziz uh the second um was gaining that exclusive access um and uh participation from hatija jengas um and uh uh, and the third was gaining that exclusive access um, and uh, uh, 
participation uh, by the Turkish government. And each one of these uh, was a, you know, was a, a slow process um, of building trust uh, among each one of these people during this incredible time of their grieving and loss and letting them know and, and, uh, and in case of Omar know um, that we were not there to, you know, sit there with a the camera, uh, shoot an interview and take off that we were there to help him fight for uh, freedom for his brothers and uh, and his families and friends that are sitting in jails and charged. Um, and that, and that um, we were there for the long haul and to help him uh, in his fight seeking justice for Jamal. And, um, uh, you know, we, we met with him in about three weeks after Jamal's murder. And for, um, the first, literally the first um, uh, five months of shooting with him, um, uh, we would leave the camera cards with him every single time after we shot uh, and said, look, Omar, we know that, uh, you know, you're, you don't know if you're ready to participate, but when you do, and if you're ready, return those camera cards to us. And, that was a huge leap of faith on our part, but it also built the trust that was needed uh, that Omar saw that that we were um, going to follow his lead. Um, and that began months of, okay, hey, I have this audio, I have this, I have that. And this was the same process with the Tisha and the same process with the Turkish government. And, and what about his... Uh, I mean, his safety in terms of like now, right? The film is going to give him more of a platform, right? People are gonna know more about him. Um, I mean, I think of uh, the main character in your last film, you know, the, the extent that you w went to, to protecting him. Um, uh, do you feel a similar responsibility here? You know, um, I feel uh, that, uh, uh, that I made this film for Omar and for Hatija. Now, Omar is under the protection of Canada. Um, Canadian intelligence protects Omar. Uh, and during this filming, there were many, many days where we couldn't shoot because a threat had come in on his life. Or as you see that scene in the subway, and all of a sudden there comes the death threat. Um, so this was real. And as we start the film, you know, with that drone shot going into that hotel, the Queen Elizabeth in Montreal. At the time, he was staying in that hotel because Canadian intelligence had said, look, you need to be in a hotel. We can protect you here. There was intelligence officers living in that hotel protecting him and his own uh, and other security that had come on. Um, and, you know, uh, so I, I can't protect Omar. You know, all, all that I can do is help um, uh, shed light on his story uh, and uh, continue to be uh, an advocate uh, for uh, for what he is uh, is is uh, is is fighting for. Nor can I protect Hatija. Um and she. You know, there has been uh, uh, many. Um, you know, uh, uh, credible assessments that she's still under surveillance by the Saudis. They apparently followed her um, when she went and lived in London, uh, so on and so forth. And it's not my job to protect them. My job is to basically craft a film, which I did, to bring this story to light, to reach a bigger audience and fight for justice and accountability for Jamal. And in doing that, I'm keeping my word to Omar and Atisha and to, you know, hopefully all of those thousands of tens of thousands of people that sit in Saudi jails, not for committing crime, crimes, but for speaking, uh, you know, a thought that doesn't align uh, with Mohammed bin Salman's. The, you know, in thinking about the film, uh, I was wondering at what point in the process did you realize that this was a film that was so much about technology, um, so much about, you know, 
uh, it's it, of course it's about Khashoggi, it's about the murder, but it's also very much about technology and about you know um, and about Twitter and about you know surveillance and about uh, hacking and you know it's a, it, it, it's and it, and it's also affects I think the style of the film. You know you 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 work with uh, these you know you see the phone being hacked in you know kind of interesting animation. So yeah, at what point in the process did did you realize that 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 was such an integral part of this story? Um, you know, I I I, I learned this um, early early on, um, and you know there was a story coming out of the of the New York Times uh, in the very uh, early days following the murder um, of Jamal that you know that Omar was claiming that he had been in fact. Um, uh, you know, hacked by Pegasus Israeli cybersecurity software um, that Saudi Arabia was using these tools to target dissidents, um, and that in fact through this hack they were able to, you know, gain intelligence on what Jamal uh, and Omar were working on, and then of course you have the Bezos hack, and um, the Bezos hack I learned about later, uh, you know, uh, further into making the film. But that was a element for me from the outset um, that I knew was present in Pegasus. And creatively, um, we were, you know, trying to figure out, uh, you know, um, you know, uh, how we were going to tell that story of the hack cinematically. And that began a, you know, huge process of, of building those uh, big animated motion graphics, CGI sequences of Pegasus, of the bees and the flies, of the Twitter Twitter trolls, and all of those kind of elements in the film that became these really big, you know, graphic elements because it, it felt like that was, um, you know, uh, the 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 best way um, to um, to bring that part of the story to light. Another key key element of the film is these transcripts, right? Um, so shocking, uh, such damning evidence, really irrefutable um, of what had happened. And I'm just wondering, as a filmmaker, also like, um, how did you see those transcripts being uh, used in the film? And like, one thing in particular, I I I, I remember. Is the way you you close up on uh, the word laughs in the transcript a few times when they're talking right. about such gruesome things, and it's like it's it's brutal, um, but it but you know but you're really revealing something quite um, yeah really quite 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 shocked. Um, well. You know, the, the, that transcript, the building of that whole sequence in the film of the transcript. And, and look, you know, uh, we are, uh, our, I and my, my team are the only people in the world that got that transcript outside of um, intelligence organizations, U.S. intelligence, British intelligence, French intelligence, the Turks. Um, and that took a year of, uh, of trust building with Turkey before they gave that transcript. And, and so that transcript uh, uh, to me, um, you know, meant um, um, how to, uh, that it was its own character. And that character in the film was, was how we were going to make and craft something incredibly visually, cinematically, with sound, music design and then bringing that transcript to life so that so that it had that visceral response of being there in the room um, and and so um, we spent uh, six months after Sundance refining that sequence um, because we felt that it was probably the uh, the, the most important part uh, of the film um, so a couple more questions one you know you mentioned Trump uh, earlier in the conversation, and you know him and his administration's complicity in in you know kind of letting Saudi Arabia off. I'm wondering if um, you know because of that, did was there a, 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 a 
a wish to get this film out before the election? Were you hoping maybe that it, it could um, restart some of the conversation about, um, uh, about you know, the Trump administration's attitude towards Saudi Arabia's human rights violations? Look, uh, ideally, the film was going to be released on October 2nd, Jamal's second anniversary. It was going to be releasing in 800 screens in the United States and in Canada. Um, we also have uh, many international uh, partners. Um, but, you know, everything has been pushed this year. Um, and I think in many ways, um, now that Biden has won the election, that Biden will be coming into office. Um, I think the film can be a voice of change, meaning, okay, this is what happened under Trump. Oh, whoa. He not only did he take no action, he protected him as he wrote Bob Woodard's book or Bob Woodard wrote in his book from the audio conversations. Trump bragged about, you know, quote, saving Mohammed bin Salman's ass. And Trump went against bipartisan support from both Congress and Senate and even a law being passed to veto weapon sales to Saudi Arabia that uh, to 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 block weapon sales to Saudi Arabia that Trump vetoed, that hopefully the viewer can see that this was not uh, the intentions of a U.S. government to uh, to have no accountability in this murder for their human rights abuses. This was rather the Trump administration protecting uh, Mohammed bin Salman. So in many ways, I'm glad that the film is coming out now rather than during the Trump administration, because now you can see that film and go, okay, well, that was the past. What are we going to do about it now? And, you know, and there's uh, been many stories written just in the past few days, New York Times, CNBC, you can go everywhere, Guardian, you know, talking about how Saudi Arabia has been hiring a whole group of lobbyists, uh, getting ready for uh, what is not appearing to be uh, a friendly Biden, Biden administration towards the kingdom. Um, so, um, you know. Well, we shall, uh, uh, we, we, we shall see. Um, but uh, I, think, I think to that extent, um, you, know, in, uh, you know, I think, it's, I think it could serve as a positive, um, the timing, plus also um, the timing of, of getting um, uh, beyond the election cycle. And unfortunately, we're still in the COVID cycle. Uh, but, you know, for us to, um, you know, uh, continue uh, on this, uh, uh, you know, on this, on this path, um, of, you know, holding the film no longer makes sense. We want it. We want to get it out there. Did in the in the making of the film or even now, Brian, did you do you ever feel like you need to worry about um, your own safety? Um, you know, you mentioned they they play dirty. So, um, you know, you, your film uh, is no holds barred in terms of the, you know, what, what it's saying about MBS and um, wondering, yeah, if you have to deal with that. Um. Look, um, I am, uh, 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 you know, I haven't been un injured under any personal threat, at least that I'm aware of. Of course, there's a lot of uh, trolling going on out there, and we're seeing uh, this trolling continue on sites such as IMDb and on Twitter, and I'm sure it's only going to increase. Um, but, you know, when you make a film like this, um, you know, uh, aside from the craft of cinema and um, and that, that is my passion and, and, and love of, of how to assemble the film as a, as a film, as, as cinema. Um, you know, I, 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 I want to make films like this to try to bring about change, to try to fight for justice uh, and accountability. And hopefully, um, if you can uh, engage um, uh, in an audience, um, through you know, you know the the cinematic craft of crafting what hopefully feels like a big uh, Hollywood feature thriller, but just so happens to be a doc that that people are moved by it. Uh, there's an emotional response, um, and all of that compounds into wanting to um, take action. And 
in failure of our government taking action or in failure of the media companies or, or huge businesses continuing uh, to essentially condone uh, you know these violations and and human rights abuses in exchange for business every it it, it falls on us uh, to take action and as we see in all great movements whether it's BLM whether it's me too uh, whether it's the Arab Spring that it starts you know at the people and I'm uh, and um, you know and I'm hopeful that that will come about and and I try to really take myself um, out of it uh, and you know, if I was if I was uh, worried or coming from a place of fear, um, I think it'd be very hard um, to make films like this. Is there uh, are there places where you suggest people go uh, in terms of like where to channel their um, their their indignation uh, after seeing the film? Are there organizations that you urge people to to support or, or sign up for? Um, well, the Human Rights Foundation, Thor Halverson's organization, he's the president of Gary Kasparov, the Grand Chess Masters, the CEO, has been very outspoken against Russia, um, financed this film in whole. Uh, they were, uh, they, they came behind this film, uh, gave it a tremendous budget to be able to cr help me craft it in, you know, the world that it is crafted in, with big effects and music and design and all those things. Um, and their mandate is to basically uh, help fight for uh, against human rights abuses, not just in Saudi Arabia, but around the world. And so I think getting involved is getting involved with the Human Rights Foundation, whether that's supporting them through donations or supporting them through action and volunteerism, or there are also freedom forms. Um, and I think that, that um, there's a lot of information to be found uh, on human rights foundations. Uh, website, and um, and that, of course, is helping Atija and helping Omar. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Brian. Thanks very much for making the film and uh, and bring it to us. Appreciate it. Well, th thanks for taking the time, Anthony, and your viewers in Chicago. It's a great city. I've spent a lot of time there, and uh, grateful uh, to you to help and give voice to this film, spread the word, and and I hope, uh, look, uh, you know, people who have been, uh, you know, who've seen it, um, the response has been pretty universal. And, uh, you know, it, uh, uh, you know, we sought to kind of craft a born identity, uh, except to make a, a documentary. Uh, and hopefully, um, you know, audiences uh, will not only be riveted, uh, but have an emotional response uh, to learn and hopefully take action. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, definitely. All right. Thanks again. Bye. Thanks, Anthony.